excuse me, but I got to get my water in this week. Anybody else carrying around a Stanley, a Yeti, uh, some other kind of knockoff, and you've got water in it right now? Would you just hold it up proud that you're getting your water in? Anybody? Anybody feel up to doing that? We got one. We got one. A few over there. A couple. All right. Good. I'm just double checking to make sure I'm not the only one trying to get my water. And my wife says that uh, we have to drink our weight in water. Being married to her, I feel like it's my job to clarify sometimes, right? Honey, do you mean get actually our weight in water? Like nobody could drink that much water. Honey, you couldn't drink that much water. You would have to drink. And then I realized I made a rookie mistake as a husband that I had kind of gone down a path now that I was going to have to think very clear about how to get out of. Like, how much would my wife have to drink, and am I going to be in trouble after I say that number, right? And so I quickly kind of maneuvered over and went, do you really have to drink like 115 pounds of water? And um, of course, she looked at me and said, you're sweet, but you're also not very smart, Uh, I'm not talking about drinking actual pounds of water. You are supposed to drink however much you weigh in ounces. Has anybody ever heard that before, drink? Is that true? Okay, so I'm still in trouble, apparently. So... So we, we, we now drink water, right? It's, it's, it's like a thing. It's healthy for us, right? It's good for us to drink water. Did anybody else grow up in a time where nobody told you to drink water? Okay, like nobody ever told me to drink water as a kid. Water was an option. It was always an option, but you were never encouraged to drink water. In fact, at uh, football practice when I was in school, you were encouraged not to drink water. Drinking water was for sissies, and so you didn't drink water, you didn't need water, and now our world has kind of turned completely upside down. In fact, kids carry water bottles. My five-year-old probably at church today has a five-year-old little Stanley something or another with a straw because they carry water all the way uh, the time with them. That's just times change. We know now that water is good for us, that water is healthy, that we need those things. It's essential uh, uh, for us. But uh, in our culture, it's, it's probably more of something that we do because we know we ought to, because it's healthy, maybe because you know it will help you to lose weight. But in the Middle East, in Jesus' day, water was life. It was essential. It was necessary. You couldn't live without water. In fact, you would die without water. We're going to talk about the Holy Spirit today as water. In fact, if you've got your Bible or if you've got something, you can pull up a Bible app. I want you to go to John chapter 7. We are in a series where we've been talking about the Holy Spirit. We've called it ghosted. We've had just a little uh, fun with that terminology. When you ghost someone in our day and age, it means you quit hanging out with them. You quit responding to their messages. You quit texting them back. But to be ghosted, at least by the Holy Spirit, means you have the presence. You have the promised presence of Jesus in your life. You have the Holy Spirit. And so we've been trying to learn, what does that mean? What is the Holy Spirit? Who is the Holy Spirit? What does the Holy Spirit do? And we've been doing it by looking at the images in Scripture that we find about the Holy Spirit. Uh, For example, in week number one, we saw that the Holy Spirit sometimes gets symbolized as a dove. In John chapter 3, when Jesus is being baptized by John the Baptist, the Father speaks and the Holy Spirit descends like a dove. Well, what does that tell us? Well, we learn that Uh, The dove represents throughout Scripture things like a new beginning, and it represents hope and peace, and it represents purity and innocence, and it represents gentleness and grace. And we began to discover how the Holy Spirit at least interacts with us. 
Last week, we, we looked at the Holy Spirit more as the wind or breath, breath of God. Uh, that's the terminology. We learned some words, uh, the Hebrew term for spirit uh, that can also be translated breath or air or wind is ruach. And uh, we looked all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. The New Testament Greek term is pneuma. All of those instances where, where uh, uh, the Holy Spirit is represented in those cases, again, it has to do with uh, with with us being able to live. The Holy Spirit, like wind, is invisible. You can't see the Holy Spirit, but you can see the effects of the Holy Spirit. And just like wind, the Holy Spirit's unpredictable. The Holy Spirit can do whatever the Holy Spirit wants to do. We can't corner him. We can't demand his power be demonstrated. He is unpredictable, and he does what he wants to do when he wants to do it. But most of all, he gives life. The Holy Spirit is life-giving. David's already uh, referred back to it. Ezekiel chapter 37, the valley of dry bones. And Ezekiel speaks the word of God. And the bones come together, but they are without life until he prophesies and says, Come breath. Come, same word, spirit. And the spirit gave them life, and they, they stood as a vast army. And so we've been talking about that spirit which we have been called, which we have been sealed in as believers. And the Holy Spirit, not only a dove, not only as, as uh, uh, air and breath and wind, but we're going to look today, the Holy Spirit as water. I mean, think of some of the terminology that the Bible uses for the Holy Spirit that, that kind of captures that image. The Spirit, we're told, is poured out on His people. That's like a liquid, like water. In fact, Joel 2.28, when God said, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. And that prophecy came true in Acts chapter 2, when no longer was the Holy Spirit occasionally given to people and occasionally taken away. But in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes on all of God's people. It was the gift of the Holy Spirit poured out on them. We're given terms like God's people are filled with the Spirit, again, filled like a container, like water being filled filled up. Uh, Ephesians 5.18, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, but instead be filled with the Holy Spirit. You, you, you don't need to fill your body with that kind of liquid. Instead, be filled with the liquid of the Holy Spirit. Or how about 1 Corinthians 12, 13? It talks about being baptized in the Spirit. We understand baptism. It's a submerging into water. It's a dunking in the water that represents a burial, a death burial, and a resurrection. And so we're talking about being baptized by one Spirit. All of that has water terminology. But when we get to John chapter 7, it's really, really used there. Jesus describes the Spirit as flowing from the lives of his followers. Okay? So verse 37, John 7, verse 37, let's start into our text there. Just a few verses long. We're going to stop and, and kind of talk about it. On the last and greatest day of the festival... Sorry, but we got to stop right there. Because some of you are like going, I like what festival? What's the festival we're talking about? It probably is important for us to know that, and it is in this occasion. What festival? Well, if you went all the way back to chapter, uh, this same chapter, verse 2, John tells us the festival. He says, This is the festival of tabernacles. Okay, what is the Festival of Tabernacles? Well, there were obviously like special holidays and feasts and festivals that the Jewish people kept. We know one of them is Passover, right? This is one of those very special times. It was called the Feast of Tabernacles. It was, it was like a harvest festival that happened in October. And so they would bring in, right, the harvest uh, there, uh, the crops, that kind of thing. But it was also a commemoration of the divine guidance that God had given his people while they were in the wilderness all the way back in the book of Exodus. By the way, we'll come to that. I promise you we'll be back in Exodus here in about three more weeks, and we're going to come to when God's people, the Israelites, are in the wilderness. And so this festival is specifically pointing back to that. In fact, one of the biggest highlights was that people 
celebrating during Jesus' days, they would build these big, leafy, temporary shelters. They were like tents. In fact, they were called tabernacles, ju- thus the term tab- uh, Feast of Tabernacles. A tabernacle just simply means a dwelling place or tent. And so this temporary place they would make, sometimes they were called booths, and again, sometimes it was called the Festival of Booths. And so people would make these, they would put them on the streets, they would put them in the square, some people would put them on the roofs of their house. And so people who were coming in from a long journey would have a place to stay to celebrate the Festival of Tabernacles in a tabernacle, right? Or sometimes people that lived there would just go, hey kids, come on, we're going to stay in the tabernacle this week because we're celebrating this festival and how God took care of them and uh, reminded them of that that dwelling that they had in in the wilderness. So that was one thing they did. Another thing they did was they, they, they lit this elaborate huge candelabra in the temple of the uh, the inner court of the temple. And this thing every night would light up, illuminate not only the courtyard, but illuminate that whole part of Jerusalem. And people could see what was going on. It, 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 it was so bright. And so that reminded them of, again, their ancestors in the wilderness and how God had guided them by a pillar of fire, right? And so they always knew that God God was with them. By the way, in the next chapter, John chapter 8, Jesus, with that as a backdrop, verse 12, John 8, 12, is going to say, I am the light of the world. How about that for an object lesson? And that's a, that's a pretty cool thing to, to, to have all that going on. Okay. How does it fit with what we're talking about today? There was also a ceremony of the outpouring of water. In fact, every morning of the festival, and then seven times during the seventh day of the festival, a, a priest would draw water from the pool of Siloam, and he would take that water in this golden pitcher, walk toward the temple, a crowd of people following behind him, and he would pour this liquid offering into the ceremonial bowl, and it would drain into the base of the altar. And you're like, what is, what is the water all about? Well, again, it's pointing back to Exodus, pointing back to when God's people... And there was one occasion in chapter 17 of Exodus. Remember, the people are complaining because they're thirsty. They're out in this desert, and and it's dry, and they need water, and they're complaining to Moses, and Moses goes to God and says, God, what do I do about this? People are complaining, and God says, take your staff and take it to this certain rock, and when you put that staff on the rock, water would come out, and water miraculously flowed out of this rock. And all of God's people are miraculously uh, quenched of their thirst because of this water. Now you're thinking, I know you're getting nervous because we're only a half a verse in, right? Okay, I promise it's going to go faster now. It's in that setting that Jesus then begins to say, I'm going to go back and set it up again, verse 37, on the last and greatest day of the festival." When likely seven times that water has been ceremoniously paraded through, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Man, what a bold statement. They already knew that what this was representing what this this ceremony was representing god miraculously providing water for his thirsty people and then jesus stands up and says let anyone who is thirsty let him come to me and drink you know what that's not the only time jesus claimed to be some special kind of water In fact, just a few chapters before John chapter 4, Jesus is with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well, and they get into this conversation about religion and about drinking and about drawing water from the well, and Jesus says that he had living water for her. And he told her, whoever drinks the water that I give will never thirst. Jesus is offering us something 
that will cause us to never, ever thirst spiritually again. Something that represents God providing for his people everything that they need. Well, Jesus goes on in verse 38 and gives us more information about it. He says, whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water, um, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Jesus says, as Scripture has said, where does Scripture say that? Well, we could talk about a whole lot of them. Honestly, we don't know which Scripture Jesus is talking about. Jesus didn't tell us a specific one. But I think we'll cover all of them throughout the rest of the sermon that talk about this, this idea, or at least the ones that are, that are significant here. Jesus is saying, as Scripture said, rivers of living water will flow out of them. It, it's literally out of the belly. It, that, 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 uh, that for those people, the seed of emotions right here in the belly and the guts. He said, the Holy Spirit, the river, rivers of water are going to flow out from them. Then John in verse 39 is going to add an editorial comment to help us understand because I don't know that I understand. What does that mean? Rivers of living water are going to flow out of us? What does that mean? Verse 39, John again with editorial comment, by this, he meant the Spirit, capital S Spirit, Holy Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. And by the way, John says, up to that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. So we're still living in this John 7 time frame when the Holy Spirit hadn't been given to all people because Jesus hadn't been glorified. Jesus is glorified when he dies on the cross for mankind and when he is resurrected from the grave to show that he is, in fact, the Almighty God. So that's when he's glorified. It's after that, then, that the Holy Spirit is given. And so John is saying it hasn't happened yet, but what Jesus was talking about when he said rivers of water, rivers of water will come out of them, John is saying he's talking about the Holy Spirit. He's connecting the dots for us. That the Holy Spirit here, when Jesus is talking, is represented as water or as a river, and that is going to happen. In fact, that's all been anticipated. We've already talked about Joel 2, pouring out living water on all people. But 700 years before this, the prophet Isaiah said it this way, Isaiah 44, 3, I will pour water. Look how he words it, talking about the Holy Spirit. I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground i will pour out my spirit he's not just talking about water he is talking about the holy spirit i will pour out my spirit on your offspring my blessing on your descendants so isaiah is telling us there's going to come a day when the holy spirit is going to be poured out when the holy spirit's going to be like a stream when the holy spirit's going to be like a river and jesus is saying that That day's coming. Come to me if you're thirsty. What a wonderful picture of the Holy Spirit working in the human heart. That those who come to Christ would find living water that satisfies the deepest thirst from within. And through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, that living water, it produces a new life that eventually bubbles up and it, it, it bubbles to the surface and begins, becomes evident to others. And this living water, it never becomes stagnant. It, 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 never, it never becomes, you know, just a standstill. It produces a dynamic, abundant, exciting new life. And those who respond to the call, who accept Jesus, receive him, they receive the Holy Spirit as a permanent, indwelling, life-changing presence. And that's an amazing statement Jesus makes. So let's, let's like dig down a little bit more into it. What, what does it mean for us? What, what do we learn from that statement about the Holy Spirit? I'm going to give you five things. If you're a note taker, this is a great place for you to pull it out and just start, start writing them down. Here's the first thing. We're told that the Holy Spirit takes residence inside of you takes up residence in 
you. That's what Jesus said. This river of life comes from within them. This is not just some spirit that's floating around, around you, beside you. This is something that is in you. If you're a believer in Jesus, the Holy Spirit dwells permanently in you. In fact, look how the Apostle Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. He said, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? Temple, tabernacle, it's all the idea of tent and dwelling, right? That your body is the dwelling place, the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, he goes on to say, whom you have received from God. So you got the Holy Spirit from God, and he lives inside of you, in your body. The context of 1 Corinthians chapter 6 is sexual sin. And the Apostle Paul is reminding believers who still struggle with sexual sin to go, wait a minute, evaluate what's going on here. Your body, the the point of which you are committing sexual acts, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So when you walk around through life, it's not just you. you got the Holy Spirit inside of you, the temple of the Holy Spirit. And when you sin, it's not just you sinning. You're dragging along the presence of God, the Holy Spirit, with you. The Apostle Paul says, consider that and make sure you honor God with your body because the Holy Spirit's in you, takes up residence in you. Number two, the Holy Spirit provides an inexhaustible supply. Inexhaustible. Never runs out. It never goes dry. It just keeps, keeps on moving. That's the kind of idea that Jesus was giving us about this, this flowing river, which causes a problem for people who live in Tulsa because we think of a river like the Arkansas River, right? It doesn't seem like a real river. I mean, if you can wade across it, if you can drive across the bridge and you see more sand than you see water, you look at it and you're like, picture for us when Jesus says that the Spirit is a river of life for us. We, know, we get it, right? I mean, the Arkansas River was once something different, but now it's been contained so many times upstream that we have this little bitty dab of water coming through until like 2019 when uh, we actually had flood warnings going off multiple times, and it uh, changed the course of the banks of the Arkansas River, and we saw what a river looks like. Jesus says that's what the Holy Spirit is like. It's like that kind of river that's moving. Listen, if, if you're dying in the desert, the one thing that you want is give me a glass of water, give me a bottle of water, give me a cup of cold water, water. And what Jesus is promising us is more than a cup or a bottle or a jug or a Stanley or a Yeti. So much more than that, he promises a never-ending flow of clear, cool, living water without pollution. Rivers that will never run dry. What that means for you is the Holy Spirit's never going to dry up on you The Holy Spirit is never going to run out on you. Now, we're told that we can stifle or we can dam up the flow and contain the Holy Spirit, keep the Holy Spirit away. Holy Spirit's still a part of your life, but but we can do that. The Holy Spirit himself, an inexhaustible supply. Okay? Number three, the Holy Spirit brings life to your soul. Brings life. We've said that every week. It is life-giving. The Holy Spirit on creation, uh, Genesis 1, hovering over the depths, right? And then boom, God said, let there be, and all of creation happens. Brings life. Valley of dry bones, Even the bones that come together and bodies are put back together, but until the breath, the Spirit breathed into those bones, there's no life. 
It's because the Holy Spirit brings life. Like we said, in the Middle East, water is not just a refreshing thing. It's not just a nice thing, a healthy thing. In the same way, the Holy Spirit is not just a nice thing to have around. He gives us real life. And that's repeated throughout Scripture, and it's repeated at, even at the end of Scripture. You get to Revelation chapter 22, and we're seeing an image of another river. This is the river of the water of life there in Revelation 22. It says, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the streets of the city. By the way, the city is this new Jerusalem that John is picturing for us. The bride of Christ is the church, and this Holy Spirit is the living water that's flowing from Jesus to the people and then from out of the people into the world for the healing of the nations. It's life brings healing. In fact, you get all the way to verse 17, literally almost the end of the Bible, verses away from the end of the Bible. Let the one who is thirsty come, and let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. It's the Spirit. Spirit brings life to us. Number four, the Holy Spirit satisfies the deep thirst inside of you. It satisfies that deep thirst. It's God's answer for that deep thirst within us. And we're told that when, when the Holy Spirit comes into our life, he comes like a river. It's not, not, just a, not just a dribble. This is like a river that is rushing over dry ground. The Holy Spirit brings the life of God to the thirsty soul. It quenches the spiritual thirst that all of us have. In fact, you've done this, I'm sure, before in your life. You've been working in the yard, mowing the yard, doing some landscaping. Maybe you came in after running, uh, after exercising, after a hot day, and you were so thirsty, you grabbed the first thing that you could find that wasn't water, and you downed it, right? Maybe it was some kind of fruit juice. Maybe it was some kind of soda. Maybe, it, I, I, who knows? You doubt it, and you immediately are like, that did not help. Now you have this sticky feeling in your throat. You're still thirsty. You just drank 12 ounces out of a can of something. And in fact, not only are you thirsty, but now your thirst is worse because you've got that flavor, that taste, that stickiness in your throat. And here's what I think a whole lot of Christians do. We, we, we know we've got this spiritual thirst. We know we need to quench it with something. And I think there are people that are looking in all kinds of different places. They're searching, they're exploring, they're looking, they're hoping, they can find something. And we chase all kinds of things except for the Holy Spirit, the water of life to quench our thirst. Quit chasing all those other things. Quit chasing after things that aren't going to fulfill, that aren't going to quench your thirst, and go to the true source, Jesus says, the water of life, where you'll never be thirsty again. Here's number five. We also see from John 7 that the Holy Spirit flows out from you to those around you. You had to have noticed that when John is explaining this, he's talking about the river of life. It says, well, in fact, Jesus says, will flow out from within them. Because the river of life, the Holy Spirit, is never intended to be contained, never intended to stop. It is, it is something that flows through us, a flowing out from the believer to those that are around them. Because what happens is when you're a believer in Jesus and the Holy Spirit is evident, then people are like, what is going on with them? They used to be thirsty, but they don't look thirsty anymore. Where is that source of water coming from? I want to know what that's all about. It moves from us to other people. It flows through us. In fact, there's this interesting picture in Ezekiel 47, okay? 
You may want to go back and read this again at a later time. Ezekiel 47 gives us a picture of another river. Doesn't tell us specifically about this river being the Spirit. In fact, I think the river in Ezekiel 47 is representative of the Holy Spirit infused church. It comes from the presence of God, from the temple, and it keeps getting deeper and it keeps getting wider and it keeps rushing stronger. And it's this idea again of what Christians do with the Holy Spirit. God flows through them, His Spirit flows through them, and it's evident. Can I just tell you what I think? Sometimes we exchange for a regular infusion of the Holy Spirit flowing through us and the rhythms that we live out of the Holy Spirit continually speaking through us and we continually allow that to flow through us. I think we opt for something way cheaper. We do a form, I think, of Christians, I'm just going to call it pond hopping. I don't know if you've ever done some pond hopping. If you're a duck hunter, you've probably done that. It means you go to one pond, you scare the ducks up, you shoot at them, you go to the next pond for some more ducks, right? Or you might do it as a fisherman. You, you fish for a while in a pond, and you go to the next pond to see if you can get some more fish or some bigger fish, right? It's pond hopping, and sometimes I think we Christians do that. Again, instead of the regular rhythm of the Holy Spirit, us receiving from the Holy Spirit and flowing from us as we We pond hop. And so we come to church on Sunday, and we hope to get some really neat experience from the Holy Spirit and that it'll contain within us and be vibrant until the next Sunday when we can do it again. And sometimes that's not enough, so we go to a conference. We want to learn from the Holy Spirit. We want to have a Holy Spirit experience. We want something to feel warm and fuzzy and feel good, make us feel good. And it happens, and we hope it stays the next conference or the next event or whatever we we take the shortcut and we pond hop with the holy spirit instead of what jesus really promises and that's a regular experience of the holy spirit flowing outside of us that then becomes evident with things like what paul calls in galatians 5 the fruit of the holy spirit love joy peace Patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. The evidence of the Holy Spirit inside of you being a regular thing flowing through you is when you begin to love people that aren't lovable, that you shouldn't love. And when you have joy in your life, when you shouldn't be joyful because things aren't good, Or when you have peace in your life, when the last thing you should have is peace because of all the chaos in your life. Listen, those are things you can't just make yourself do. That is a true power, empowering of the Holy Spirit, producing something in you that you cannot produce on your own. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Fills our lives with living water. If you're thirsty you're thirsty this morning, take a drink and see. In fact, if you've ever felt spiritually like dry ground, or you've ever felt thirsty for more of Jesus, or if you've ever felt empty and needing to be filled up, the Holy Spirit, that's what he does. He's like a river of water, the water of of life. And so you don't need to stay dry. You don't need to stay empty. You don't need to stay thirsty. You, as a believer, were not made to live in a desert. God didn't call the Holy Spirit to to hole up in your life. He called the Holy Spirit to come and to quench your thirst, to fill your emptiness, to cover the arid ground around you, and then flow out from you. And so this morning, can we all just walk out of here with kind of this idea that I will not be content with a dry, lifeless faith. You are not made for that. And can we just agree corporately that we will not be content to be a dry, lifeless, empty church? We weren't corporately created for that. If you're thirsty for something more than just going through the motions of church, 
The Holy Spirit answers that for us. He is a river of life. Father, we're grateful for that promise to us. The promise to give us something that we could not do on our own. The promise of your presence in our life, even when we don't feel like it, even when it doesn't seem like it, that your spirit is evident and available to us. And so, Father, we pray. Pray that, uh, that you would fill us, that it would overflow from our lives like full cups, that your Holy Spirit would be evident, the fruit of the Spirit would be evident in our lives. Father, forgive us when we have stifled the Holy Spirit, when we've not said yes to the Holy Spirit, when we've tried to quench the Holy Spirit or control the Spirit. God, we give you permission. Come, breathe. Come, Holy Spirit. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.